Okay, so let's uh, continue with this kinematic discussion. So what we are talking about here is that there are certain forces acting on a fluid particle which we are still not bothered to, to discuss but as a result of those uh, forces what happens to the fluid particle is that it translates from one location to the other it undergoes some sort of a rotation and it also undergoes a deformation which normally we will uh, split as a volumetric deformation and a shear deformation. So let us try to look at each of these uh, in, a, in a more detail. So the standard way of describing this uh, situation is uh, you show a fluid particle at a certain location at a certain time and for the sake of uh, keeping everything manageable uh, I am showing a two dimensional fluid particle which has a dimension delta x by delta y. So again here is a fluid particle in the sense that we are essentially talking about the same fluid material enclosed within this volume. Under the action of forces sorry under the action of forces all these things are going to happen simultaneously the translation rotation and the two types of deformations and a time equal to delta t later what you will typically find is that the fluid particle has basically become something like this. Okay. Uh, so, in particular you can say that this horizontal line AB gets uh, not only translated but also rotated through an angle of delta alpha. Similarly, the vertical line AC not only gets translated but also gets rotated through an angle uh, delta beta. So, why, why is this happening? Because basically there are velocity gradients that exist in the flow. So, in order to show those velocity gradients what I am showing here is that point A let us say is our reference point and at this uh, reference point let the velocities in the x direction be u and v and again using the first order Taylor expansions what we are uh, showing here is the u and v velocities at point B and point C. So, you can see that at point B it is simply u plus u dx that is partial now times delta x because it is a two dimensional situation now and u is going to be a function of x y t etcetera. Uh, here the v velocity again likewise is going to be v plus partial derivative with respect to x of v times delta x and so on. So, under this situation what is going to happen is that this fluid particle then goes to a later location and also gets deformed in, in the manner that is shown and in general this angle of rotation delta alpha is not equal to delta beta. So, what we do for the purpose of derivation is that we essentially assume that in the positive uh, x direction velocities increase positive y direction velocities increase. In reality it could be happening whichever way, but for the purpose of coming up with a uh, consistent set of results we, we assume that. Okay. So, as I wrote here it is a cumulative effect of all these four things or three things happening simultaneously. What is normally done is an exercise called the decomposition of motion in which each of these effects is separately quantified in some sense. So, let us look at that out of which the translation is the most obvious one that it is physically going from one location to, to the next. So, that is that is fine. Let us look at the uh, linear strains and correspondingly then there will be linear strain rates. So, if you look at the two segments a b and a c which are essentially marking our fluid particle what is going to happen to a c if I can show this is if, if this is a c you can see from your side this is where the u velocity is acting this is where the u plus d u d x delta x is acting. So, obviously <coughs> you know, uh, these two are different. So, as this fellow moves translation wise it is also going to get stretched differently in the sense that this end will be stretched differently this end will be stretched meaning pushed differently. In that sense it is undergoing eventually a linear strain. Okay. 
So, what is causing this linear strain? It is basically these x direction velocities, those are causing the linear strain. Similarly, if you look at the vertical segment AC, the linear strains for that segment are caused by the vertical velocities v at point A and v plus d d y partial of v delta y. So, now let us see what happens. So, I am using the standard symbol in some sense epsilon suffix 2 x's and we will come to this double x double y x y notation little later right now you just go with it. It is basically the change in the length of that segment a b divided by its original length a b that is the standard form of strain expression. So, now you see as I was saying that point b will be stretched by an amount u plus d u d x delta x times whole thing times delta t in the time period delta t. This fellow will be actually pushed by an amount u times delta t. Sorry. So, that is precisely what I have written. The difference between those two will give me the differential stretching for the element uh, the, the, the line element and divided by the original length which is delta x and if you simply go ahead and simplify this you will end up with a d u d x partial times delta t and therefore, since this is a linear strain I divide by that delta t altogether take the limit as delta t tends to 0 and I will get a linear strain rate which is what we are interested in in, in fluid mechanics which will be denoted by E suffix 2 x s and with a dot which is simply telling me the time derivative and that is after you divide by delta t throughout it will be simply partial derivative of u with respect to x. So, this is for the horizontal segment a b exactly the same thing you can talk about for the vertical segment a c and in that case it will simply come out as the y derivative of the y component of the velocity. So, for the horizontal segment a b it came out as x derivative of the x component for the y it will come out as y derivative of the y component and if you want to simply generalize it without really thinking much it is going to be simply the z derivative of the z velocity. So, these are all individual linear strain rates if you want. Okay. Now, we normally talk about a volumetric strain rate which is what volumetric strain rate is basically forget about the delta 1 over delta t for now the volumetric strain on a per unit time basis. So, what is volumetric strain the change in the volume of the particle divided by its original volume and then you take the 1 over delta t with delta t tending to 0 as simple as that. So, the way it is written is basically we are following this fluid particle now okay. it goes from location 1 to location 2 and does all sorts of things. So, inherently we are talking about a Lagrangian rate here the reason is because we are following a fluid particle. So, this delta of delta v delta v is obviously the volume element of the fluid particle divided by the time interval with the time interval tending to 0 will give you the limit as the substantial rate of change of the volume element itself. So, this volume element here that is dividing the, the, uh, the change in the volume element is written outside here the time interval delta t has been taken and inside and then the limit has been taken to write this substantial derivative of the volume element itself that is the idea. So, now this is as far as the mathematical notation goes what we are talking about is there is a uh, fluid particle which undergoes linear strain rates thereby its volume changes and we are interested in knowing the new volume you subtract the old volume divide by the old volume and find out that that is the volumetric strain and then divide that by the delta t you get the volumetric strain rate fine. So, now the new volume is simply the original length l b uh, a b plus the change in that length times original length a c plus the change in that this will give me the new volume right because each a b and a c have been stretched minus this l, l of a b times l of a c is the old volume and divide that again by the old volume which is l a b 
times L A C and of course, this one delta t is missing which I should which, which I should write. Uh, what I have written out here is only the expression for the volumetric strain okay. it is the new volume minus old volume divided by the old volume that is the strain. So, I need to have a 1 over delta t here with the understanding that that delta t tends to 0 fine. This is a bit of algebra in the sense that we have actually expressions for all these guys. So, what is L a b? It is sorry it is delta x fine. Delta of L a b was worked out here this numerator here okay, which is simply uh, d u d x delta x delta t. Same thing for the length of a c and the change in the length of a c which were uh, delta y and correspondingly you can work out the, the change in the length a c. If you actually put together all these and carry out the product what we are interested in is after then subtracting this delta x times delta y divided by delta x delta y etcetera. You simplify all this and eventually you will realize that there will be some terms left which will be multiplied by delta x times delta y type situation. So, as we want to shrink this fluid element to a small size the terms which will have delta x times delta y multiplying will be considered to be small compared to the terms which do not have that. So, this is the algebra which I want you to work out and what you you should realize at the end of it is by appropriate simplification of throwing out the so called second order terms as we say we essentially obtain the expression that the volumetric strain rate now is simply d d x partial of u plus d d y partial of v for this two dimensional element. So, this particular algebra where you substitute all these expressions carry out the product subtract all the previous volumes and such and realize that there are some terms which are second order nature this is something that I want really to you, you to work out and eventually you should get d u d x plus d v d y. And if you want to then generalize to a 3D I will simply add to this the z derivative of the z velocity and if you realize the addition here is simply in the vector form given as the divergence of the velocity field. Uh, so, it is not the v dot del it is actually the del dot v. So, you knowing that expression for the uh, del operator or the gra gradient operator there you can make sure that del dot v really comes out to be uh, d u d x plus d v d y plus d w d z. So, that is essentially the volumetric strain rate and if it turns out that the volumetric strain rate is equal to 0 we call that situation as an incompressible flow. So, the, the condition that we will look for incompressible flow is this del dot v or the divergence of velocity in Cartesian given by d u d x plus d v d y plus d w d z three dimensions is equal to 0 which essentially means that the fluid particle is not really undergoing any volumetric strain rate changes as it moves ok. So, please I will request that this algebra you please work out if you have any problems let me know um, I will try to help out with, with that alright. So, that is all about the linear strain rates and the corresponding volumetric strain rates. Now, we said that the the particle can be thought of having undergone a rotational motion also. So, there are a couple of different ways of explaining this uh, rotation so, let me just go back to that picture. So, what we have here is that this a prime b prime which you can say is the stretched element having translated now is rotating that is the way you can think about it. Same thing for this uh, a prime c prime which is a c translated and stretched and now it is rotating ok. So, a, a b has essentially undergone a counter clockwise rotation of delta alpha where a c has gone a clockwise rotation of delta beta with delta alpha not necessarily equal to delta beta. So, one way of looking at this entire situation is the following. So, you just say that 
let the angular displacement for AB which is positive delta alpha, why? Because it has undergone a counterclockwise rotation be written as one half of delta alpha minus delta beta plus one half of delta alpha plus delta beta. So, if you see it is the same thing as delta, it is just split in a certain manner. Okay. Is that fine? Same thing you look for the angular displacement of the segment AC. Here, because it has undergone a clockwise rotation of delta beta, angular displacement, that minus delta beta is written as one half of delta alpha minus delta beta plus and again in some roundabout way I am writing this on purpose minus one half of delta alpha plus delta beta. The, the, the reason this perhaps is slightly appealing this way of writing is because just look at the two blue boxes, they are the same expressions. So, what I am arguing here is that this appears as if both A B and A C which are uh, this way, yeah. they seem to have undergone a counterclockwise rotation of whatever is the amount enclosed in the blue box, because right now we are putting signs also along with everything. So, both A B and A C can be thought of having undergone an anticlockwise rotation of the magnitude given by one half of delta alpha minus delta beta and further a shear displacement each of magnitude shown by whatever is enclosed in the red box. So, now why am I talking about magnitude one is positive and one is negative as you can see. Okay. So, which one is positive? The A B is positive meaning that you can think about A B as having undergone a rotational motion of half delta alpha minus delta beta and further shear displacement of one half delta alpha plus delta beta and thereby it lands in a position of delta alpha. Exactly the same thing you can think about for the uh, segment A C, where the segment A C can be thought of having undergone a counterclockwise rotation of delta alpha minus delta beta over 2 followed by a counterclockwise shear displacement, because there is a minus sign, but of the same magnitude as what is in here. This perhaps is little physically appealing, you know many times you will see that most of the books will simply say that the rotation is going to be given by the average of the angular velocity of these two guys uh, and so on. In this way, why I can say then that there is a some sort of a rigid body rotation and then there is a shear deformation involved is if you see the blue boxes, the blue boxes say that both segments have essentially undergone the same angular displacement both of magnitude as well as sense, which means that it is as if it is like a rigid body rotation of the amount one half of delta alpha minus delta beta. Okay. On the other hand, if you see the other two, one definitely is a counterclockwise rotation, the first one, the other one is the same magnitude, but a clockwise one. So, this is the way I like to present it just because it gives me a sense of decomposing this rotational motion into a pure rigid body like rotation and then followed by a shear rotation. I, I hope it is somewhat clear. So, if that is the case, then we simply say that then the rigid body like angular displacement is simply given by the blue box, which is one half of delta alpha minus delta beta. And now, this is the angular displacement. If I divide by the delta t, I will give, I will get the angular dis, angular velocity uh, of the fluid particle. This is a rigid body like angular velocity. And since it is a 2 D particle that I am talking about in the x y plane, I am essentially talking about rotation about the z axis. Right Now, what is involved is the expressions for delta alpha and delta beta. Those need to be found out. If you go back to the geometry, this is slightly methodical you have to see. Delta alpha I will basically say is for small time periods delta delta t, it is simply this length b prime b double prime divided by a prime b double prime, which is hopefully what I have written here b prime b double prime a prime b double prime. 
and each of those you can work out in complete detail. Again work out the, the algebra and you will see that some terms will have left some second order terms. Cancel those and you will get delta alpha equal to dv dx times delta t. So, this is actually more or less worked out here. It is just that after this term you have to do the simplification which you can do. In exactly the same manner I want that delta beta which I am saying it is this length c prime c double prime divided by a prime c double prime this is what I have written here and correspondingly the expressions you get to find it is dv dy times delta t. So, I have the expression for delta alpha, I have the expression for delta beta, I just put it in here and I realize that the angular velocity then of the fluid particle for the rotation about z axis is simply coming out as half dv dx minus du dy. So, this expression is the, the correct expression whichever way you look at it, whether it is simply looked at as a average of the two angular velocities of the two um, segments. But the way this delta alpha and delta beta are split, it gives you a clear idea that there is a rigid body rotation involved followed by the shear deformation. Okay. So, this is something that you normally may not find in the books. The only book which talks about it in this fashion in some sense not completely is by Fox and McDonald the latest edition. The seventh edition is, is what I, I found that it talks about like this, but there is a um, uh, there is a typographical mistake in that uh, chapter on this. So, I hope you can find that out. But anyway, this is this is the idea behind decomposition of the motion. Um, so, this is what I have for the angular velocity about uh, z axis. I can now generalize because I know the expression. So, sorry, I know the expressions for the z angular velocity in terms of um, dv dx and du dy. So, it's simply looking at this expression, I can go ahead and I form what is called as an angular velocity vector which will have the three components omega x, omega z, this should be y sorry, this is omega z which we just worked out. So, the omega x and omega y, this should be y, omega y is something that I have written out here. Make sure that those are correct, I think those are correct, those are correct. And then you can put it together in a compact vector form um, where you introduce this so called curl of the velocity del cross v. Um, so, if you remember from your vector uh, uh, analysis, the curl is evaluated as the determinant where uh, the first row is i j k unit vector, the second one in this case will be the uh, components of this del operator d d x d d y d d z partial and then u v w and you just use your standard uh, uh, determinant rule to obtain the cross product. If you put it together you will see that the z component is this here, x component is this and y component is this. And popularly if you see the books they will call this curl of velocity as the vorticity. So, you will see that many times this relation is quoted often that the angular velocity is one half of uh, the, the vorticity or the vorticity is twice of the angular velocity. Either way whether you are talking about vorticity or whether you are talking about angular velocity, what we are talking about is the spinning of the fluid particle about its own axis. Please keep that in mind. The fluid particle may be actually traveling along a straight flat streamline, but it can still be spinning about its axis, it is not that it is traveling along necessarily a uh, curved streamline. And, uh, if either of these guys that is either the angular velocity or the vorticity is 0, then we simply have what is called as an irrotational flow which is a special case. Um, many times if you are dealing with inviscid flows, you will automatically invoke this irrotational uh, assumption as well along with the uh, inviscid flow and then you can deal with what is called as a potential flow which we are not going, going to get into, but this is something that, that you can note down. The key idea though is this um, that you split it in, in this fashion 
and in that sense you can say that it is undergoing uh, what you can say is okay, this is from my side if this is the case is undergoing a rigid body rotation by the same amount and then it is doing this is that fine so this and then this that is the idea why half and half is the question that one has to one can split it whichever way I can do a three half, three fourth and a one fourth three fourth and a one fourth that is something for you to think but I, I hope that the, the physical idea is clear this is something that you again as I said normally you may not find it in this fashion in the books um, but if you just recall this picture always in your mind this this and then this I think it is clear now I do not want to use that average actually that is precisely what I am saying you can always interpret it that way that it is the average of the, the two angular velocities that is another way of looking at it uh, there is little more it is little more involved if you if you see that Kundu's book, uh, you you'll get some some clue to it. Actually, what happens is that half, if you utilize, you can show that um, this the way this is written is essentially independent of how initially those two lines are um, oriented. As long as they are perpendicular to each other, whichever way they are oriented, they'll always bring about that half. But that's fine. Don't 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 worry about it too much. Okay, so that is uh, that is basically your um, angular velocity component of that decomposition of motion. So let's just quickly go back. What we had was translation, which we never even talked about because it's pretty easy to visualize. Rotation and shear deformation is what essentially is linked uh, in some sense. So rotation is what we have talked about. Shear deformation we will now look at and the volumetric deformation is coming through those linear strain rates which we first talked about. So these are the linear strain rate, then the volumetric strain rate, now the angular uh, uh, velocity and now finally the shear deformation. So for the shear deformation uh, these two magnitudes, remember our picture again. Uh, it goes through like this rigid body and then it is going like this. So the final magnitudes of those two shear deformations are same as one half of delta alpha plus delta beta. The, the sign here simply says that it is a clockwise uh, rotation. But these two are simply then added as a total shear deformation in the xy plane and that is what is called um, or that is what is denoted by epsilon suffix x y with delta alpha and delta beta added. If you want to compute the rate of shear deformation then you simply divide this by delta t take the limit as delta t tending to 0 call that e dot x y. We already have the expressions for delta alpha and delta beta this was for delta beta this was for delta alpha. So just plug in those and you will see that the rate of shear deformation in the xy plane simply comes in as d, dv dx partial plus du dy partial. Uh, yeah, so that, that half is gone and it is simply a plus. And likewise then you can easily generalize the two other shear deformation rates in the other two planes e dot xz and e dot yz just by looking at the expression um, for the rate of shear deformation in the xy plane that is that is pretty straightforward. You can repeat it formally if you want you can repeat the same exercise by drawing the picture in the xz plane uh, if you want and coming out with uh, complete analysis. But once you know the expression here for the xy you can just looking at it analogously you can write down the expressions for the remaining two planes. That is more or less what is involved uh, as uh, kinematics part that typically we include in our uh, undergraduate class. Um, as I said a pretty decent discussion of this is available in the Fox, uh, Fox's book. Uh, 
unfortunately gupta and gupta do not have a good detailed discussion on the kinematics part uh, in in potter's book also there is a reasonable discussion but the best part for this is really the fox's book but the latest edition the seventh edition as is available today in the indian market uh, that really has very very nicely written explanations for how to get these various rates of deformations and such there is a little bit of difference in the way they work out the analysis but one way or other is not very different as long as you are following the logic i think it should be fine okay any any question on this this is the, the only thing that i really want you to work out is this this algebra to make sure that by discarding certain higher order terms second order terms you actually bring about this uh, du dx plus dv dy that's the only thing that is worthwhile as um, an algebra to work out and i think apart from one error that i had done here which i'll correct yeah here there should have been a 1 over uh, delta t uh, because we are talking about the strain rate whereas what i have written is simply the expression for the strain uh, other than that actually all details i have put on these slides so if you just want to work out the algebra and make sure that you are indeed getting these i think that's that's plenty so do you now the 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 question is do you always do this in the fluid mechanics class or you some some people do looks like this is worthwhile doing because uh, most of these things you are later on going to use when it comes to the uh, differential analysis of fluid motion where you connect the sh the stresses to the strain rates you need all these expressions so that is the reason we uh, we do it um, in a reasonable detail right i think that is more or less what i have for the kinematics part okay let's just quickly look at a i'm not even going to work out the examples because uh, once you know these formulas in some sense is just a plug in given some velocity field and such so let's just quickly look at some of these things so i have the first problem here where uh, the temperature is given as a function of y and time and certain functionality is provided with a velocity u velocity as a function of y so this is the only velocity that apparently is present in the flow and the temperature is a function of y and time fine so what is asked is determine the rate of change of temperature of a fluid particle located at y equal to 0 at t equal to 20 so just tell me what is asked to be found out that is good enough rate of change of the temperature let me say experienced by a fluid particle correct so it's everything is correct so what is asked is the substantial derivative of temperature so let me write that for for one time so what is actually asked is uh, capital d dt of temperature is asked and this i will simply write as partial derivative with respect to time plus in general in general now in this case what you have is let me go back to the screen right so now you just tell me from the expression partial derivative of t with temperature with respect to time it will exist because the functionality has time in it that's fine u times dt dx was the next term what about that no because t is not a function of x at all correct same thing for uh, v times dt dy because there is no v velocity given only u is used there and there is nothing to talk about w so going back then yep exactly <laughs> only first term is left so this is gone this is gone this is gone so only this fellow is left and all this was required to be evaluated at uh, y equal to 0 and t equal to 20 so you just have to evaluate this uh, 
derivative with respect to time of that functionality that is given and substitute these two guys there and that is it. So, whenever you see words like uh, acceleration of the fluid particle, it necessarily is implying that we are talking about the substantial acceleration or the material acceleration. Um, so, wherever that fluid particle word show up, we have to think that this is a substantial rate of change, fine. So, that is that. In the second example, some velocity field is given. So, this 2 x minus 4 is basically your u c times y is your v and phi times t is the w. First part says that determine the value of c if the flow is to be incompressible. So, if the flow is to be incompressible, this thing has to be satisfied. So, that is it. You have all u v w just work out that expression and you can find out whatever that c must be in order for the del dot v to be equal to 0. Here the acceleration that a fluid particle experiences while passing the point 3 comma 2. So, what is getting asked here? Again substantial acceleration, if you want you can directly write it as a vector uh, expression or you actually split it as an x direction acceleration and a y direction acceleration if you want. So, let me just point out what I mean by that. So, if, if you want you can write this as d capital d t of u equal to same thing here. Same thing for v and w and then simply work out whatever these expressions are based on the velocity field that is given to be evaluated at whatever point 3 comma 2. So, that is that is that. Okay. Here some velocity field is given again. So, u is equal to x and v is equal to minus y. So, here the first part is equation of the path line for the particle situated at x y equal to 1 comma 2 at time equal to 0. Okay. Let us just look at this and the second part is equation of the streamline through the same point. So, u is equal to x, v is equal to minus y fine. Equation of the path line if you recall uh, what we had written was you write d x over d t equal to u d y over d t equal to v and you integrate these with the initial condition that in this case x naught equal to 1 is given at time equal to 0 and y naught equal to 2 at same time t equal to 0. So, that is it as simple as that. So, here then d x over d t equal to x right. So, d x over x equal to d t. So, then uh, x then will be e raise to t plus some constant let us say if you want. or let us write it as c e raise to the constant. What will happen to the y? This is minus y. Y then to the minus t. What is c? Even see good. Okay. Just put the initial condition and finish this. Good. For the 
streamline we had uh, dx over u equal to dy over v that was our in 2d that this is how it will be so it will be dx over x equal to dy over minus y so this will be then this if you bring it to the left hand side etc uh, ln xy equal to let us say ln of some constant if I want to write it that way. So, x y equal to a constant is the equation. How do I evaluate the constant? So, just plug in the coordinates of the point through which this is passing. So, the point of interest was given as 1 comma 2. So, c is simply equal to 2. So, x y equal to 2 is the equation of the streamline. So, before we proceed that equation of the path line, is there any way to bring the equation of the streamline from this? So, what will happen? If you let us say you you put the initial conditions in t equal to 0 here. So, e raise to this 1, this is c 1 equal to 1 correct. So, x equal to e raise to t. What about y? Hmm? y equal to 2 e raise to minus t. Can you do something here? Is there a way to eliminate e raise to t? you can. If you do that, yeah, x y equal to 2, same thing. If you eliminate t from here, you basically get x y equal to 2, which is same as your equation of the streamline. What is that? Exactly, that is the point of the, the example that if you are dealing with a steady flow situation, you will actually see that the path line and the streamline will actually come out to be exactly the same and so is the streak line. Uh, however, we are we have not talked about the equation of a streak line from a mathematical point of view. It is slightly more involved than these two guys, but this is a point which I did not want to explain earlier. I just wanted to show it through some sort of an example. So, here I hope you understand what the, what was going on. All that I have done here is that eliminated then the uh, time dependence from these two guys to get the same exact same expression. So, there is one more point that normally people will point out in the books that if you are dealing with a steady flow situation, the streamlines and the path lines will actually be identical. And then the one final example which is simply plugging in the expressions which I do not want to do now, it is again uh, some velocity is given. So, this 20 u y squared is the u minus 20 x y is the v. Uh, determine the angular velocity, vorticity vector and all rates of strain at the point such and such. All that you have to do really is that you just use whatever these expressions are and plug those with the appropriate derivatives uh, using this u and v. So, this is very straightforward. The, so, it, the, the problems if you see in this kinematics are not really that difficult, They're very straightforward. Most of the times it is uh, utilizing the expressions that we have worked out for the rates of um, strain or the, the rotation rates and the deformation rates. Uh, the idea of how to get those rates is little more important which hopefully uh, we have followed. Uh, I think that is about it for the kinematics part. So, all that we need to now do for the differential equations is all ready with us. So, before we get into that, let us just look at where you can find this information. As I said already, the better of the lot as far as the kinematics discussion is concerned is by Fox and McDonald in uh, chapters 2 and 5. So, most of the material that you saw here is in 5, some of it is in, in chapter 2. Uh, not much honestly in the Gupta's 
book, but a reasonable discussion again in the Potter's book, chapter 3. Thank you.